Welcome, let's talk about serial killers. My name is Shish Merweather and I'm the founder of Crime Viral Online. Today I'll be doing what I do best, which is talking about serial killers, because there's few places left where this is actually acceptable and where my conversations about serial killers are welcomed. I don't get invited to many weddings anymore. Well, they did hold the wedding on January the 24th, the same day Ted Bundy was executed. Like, how could I not bring that up? But apparently that's not appropriate for a maid of honor speech. But we've got this channel now so I can talk to you guys about serial killers for as long as I like. So today's episode is going to be serial killers and head injuries in childhood. Now there is one alarming factor in childhood for most notorious serial killers and that's head injuries in childhood. Researchers at the University of Glasgow found that 21% of eligible killers suffered a head injury in the past. When you compare this to the most notorious serial killers of all time, the evidence is staggering. I'll take you through some quick neuroscience, this is a sciencey bit, then I'll get you right back to the serial killer part. The prefrontal cortex, abbreviated to the PFC, is a cerebral cortex covering the front part of the frontal lobes. The frontal lobes are much more developed in humans than in any other animal. Damage to this area can often result in drastic changes of behavior, aggression, or impaired moral judgment. The frontal lobes are, in essence, the CEO of the brain, ego, and personality. This is the main boardroom for managing impulse control, empathy, and social awareness. These frontal lobes keep you in line and pop a nice lid on knee-jerk reactions such as uncontrollable rage or the desire to inflict pain on others. It's how we've evolved as a species so you can survive day-to-day -day interactions. If someone annoys us, we don't just go out and kill them. Or if we desire someone, we don't just jump on them and attempt to mate them. We're evolved enough to at least get a nice dinner out of them first. If there is severe damage to the prefrontal lobes, a person may act on impulse without thinking first and without concern for the consequences. For you and I, the thought of causing someone harm or being hurtful, we will be beside ourselves with remorse or guilt. However, for a serial killer who has suffered a head injury to the prefrontal cortex, either biologically or physically, these sort of reactions are a walk in the park. Now, sometimes this can be passed off as personality traits, however, when we look at these following notorious serial killers and how they all suffered head injuries in childhood, we cannot deny there is some correlation here. Head injuries then, mixed with a traumatic upbringing, including violent parents, these future serial killers all became a boiling pot of rage that they took out on their victims. Richard the Night Stalker Ramirez, terrorized Los Angeles and San Francisco in the mid-1980s. Striking late at night, he entered the homes of his victims and brutally attacked them with either a machete, a hammer, a tire iron, or many other sinister weapons. Born in El Paso, Texas, at the age of two, a dresser fell on top of Ramirez and nearly killed him. He was knocked unconscious and suffered a severe gash on the front of his head. At the age of five years old, he survived another serious head injury when he was knocked unconscious by a swing and this caused him to suffer epileptic seizures throughout his childhood. Later, following a highly publicized trial, he admitted to killing 13 victims. John Wayne Gacy suffered also a traumatic childhood at the hands of his alcoholic and abusive father. At the age of 11 years old, he was hit in the head which caused a blood clot in his brain and that went undetected until five years later. Due to this blood clot, he suffered from blackouts and this also resulted in an irregular heartbeat, so he was in a hospital bed for much of his adolescence. Gacy adopted in adulthood an alter ego, Pogo the Clown. Between 1972 and 1978, he murdered 33 men and teenage boys at his home in Cook County in Illinois, and he hid many of the bodies in the crawl space at that very home. A very grisly crime scene for the detectives working that case. David Berkowitz, also known as Son of Sam, suffered from multiple serious head injuries in childhood. Six years old, he was hit by a car. Then in a separate incident, he ran directly into a wall. And then one year later, he was hit in the head with a pipe that resulted in a four inch cut on his forehead. 
By the age of 12, he was torturing and mutilating animals and he was becoming increasingly antisocial. During the summer of 1976, his killing spree had really begun. He killed six people and wounded seven others, which resulted in one of the biggest manhunts in New York City history. Serial killer Albert Fish brutally murdered and mutilated children in the early 1900s. During his childhood, Fish fell from a tree which caused him a concussion that resulted in headaches throughout his entire life and also further dizzy spells. He developed several sexual fetishes throughout adulthood, including sadism, masochism, exhibitionism, and cannibalism. He boasted his number of victims was in the hundreds, though he was only charged with three known murders. Fish said, I always had a desire to inflict pain on others and to have others inflict pain on me. I always seemed to enjoy everything that hurt. Glenn Edward Rogers murdered three women between California, Florida, Mississippi and Louisiana in the 90s. He was known as the cross country killer. And it was revealed that as a baby, he would rock so violently that it would constantly be banging his head against hard surfaces like walls, floors or doors. Rogers was also slapped with such force by his mother that he stopped breathing and passed out. He later targeted women with strawberry blonde hair, the exact same hair color as his mother, the woman who he'd grown to despise. Henry Lee Lucas was convicted of murdering 11 people. However, he claimed to be responsible for more than 300 victims. He picked off his victims at random in the early 80s whilst drifting across several states. Lucas did not have an easy start in life. His mother never allowed her son to show emotion and often subjected him to brutal beatings. He recalled her smashing a piece of wood over his head when he was just seven years old. The following year, his brother accidentally slashed at him with a knife, which caused Lucas to permanently lose his left eye. A professor at Harvard Medical School examined a brain scan of the serial killer and did find abnormalities in the frontal lobes and also in the parts of the brain that are related to emotional control. There are few serial killers who are worse than Dennis BTK Raider. BTK stands for his murderous method of bind, torture and kill. Raider's killing spree lasted between 1974 to 1991, which included a break in between for a few years. In an interview for the biography, Confessions of a Serial Killer, Raider revealed as a newborn he stopped breathing and he turned blue, but his mother did not take him to a hospital for emergency care. Also as an infant, his mother accidentally dropped him. Raider later said, I actually think I may be possessed by demons. I was dropped on my head as a kid. This full study from the University of Glasgow is published in the Journal of Violent and Aggressive Behaviour. Dr. Claire Alley from the Institute of Health and Wellbeing at the University of Glasgow said, the report, which is the first of its kind to look at the available data around serial killers and these cases, identify there is a complex interplay between neurodevelopmental problems and psychosocial factors likely to lead to incidences of this kind. Now, this combination of characteristics is discovered early on in an individual's development, then a person could be predisposed to developing into a serial killer. This can lead to positive prevention measures that can result in saving lives. It doesn't, however, mean that because you suffer from a traumatic head injury in childhood that you are going to be a serial killer. As remember at the start of this video, we mentioned there needs to be that psychosocial stressor in place also. Ramirez, for example, might not have evolved into a serial killer based on the two head injuries he suffered alone. However, at the age of 12 years old, his cousin who had returned from the Vietnam War showed him sexually violent images of women he had tortured out there. And also Ramirez at this age saw his cousin shoot his wife fatally. So you take the damage to the frontal lobes, mix it with a psychosocial stressor, and that individual out in the world, sometimes the results are not going to be good. Research on this subject is still relatively new. So the more we study, the more knowledgeable we will become. So another benefit of talking about serial killers is keeping these conversations going. Therefore, having an obsession with serial killers isn't weird or creepy at all. 
it actually saves lives. That's my excuse anyway, and I'm sticking to it. So thank you for joining us for this episode of Let's Talk About Serial Killers. Feel free to like this video, subscribe to our channel, and don't forget to join us over on Facebook at Crime Viral, where we'll be continuing the conversation.